everyone, it's Lindsay, and thanks for tuning in to First Aid Express. Today, we have a very important topic to discuss and apply. Throughout your medical career, if not already, you will encounter individuals who have experienced some form of trauma in the past or are actively living through it now. Learning how to address many forms of trauma and their long and short-term impacts is critical to supporting your patient and addressing many of the underlying concerns that trauma has introduced into their lives. Learning to be an advocate, supporter, and trauma-informed healthcare worker is one of the best things you can do for many of your patients and something you can actively work on even as a preclinical medical student. Let's get a move on. Today, we have two important learning objectives. First, we will discuss common forms of trauma our patients experience, the populations affected, and long-term effects of that trauma our patients cope with. Second, we will identify and apply common practices that will not only support, but empower patients who have experienced trauma to make a meaningful impact on their health. When trauma comes to your mind, most assume sexual trauma that we see in the ED after an assault. It's certainly what makes headlines and is discussed most in media. However, trauma takes many forms and includes more than just physical assault. The wide spectrum of trauma we should start to consider includes not only physical and sexual trauma, but emotional violence like neglect, discrimination, and the impact of poverty on our patients. All these can impact an individual's wellness, both mental and physical, and can affect their health both immediately and in the long run. Did you know that the World Health Organization estimates up to 1 billion children aged 2 to 17 have experienced physical, sexual, or emotional violence or neglect in the past year? They also estimate an overwhelming 35% of women experience physical or sexual, intimate partner or non-partner violence in their lifetime. That's one in three women. Additionally, there have been countless studies that show statistically significant increases in the likelihood of trauma in low socioeconomic status and minority populations. Statistics like these should absolutely raise your eyebrows and concern you. Because that means you will without a doubt care for individuals who have experienced trauma in some form throughout their life. How we shape our encounters to address the widespread issues these patients might have is paramount to giving the care to the person and the entirety of their person not just a singular diagnosis. So what long-term effects are we concerned about and have to consider when treating a patient who has experienced prolonged trauma and stress responses? Well, there are a lot and they are widespread. One of the most common are emotional disorders of all kinds, including anxiety, depression, regulation disorders, and PTSD. These emotional issues combined with other stressors lead to higher incidence of suicide and substance use disorders in addition to other risky behavior. However, trauma also impacts physical health in the long term, including high rates of heart and lung disease, obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome, and other conditions due to poor coping skills, low healthcare access, low SES, and implications of poverty and racial discrimination. Many of the patients you may encounter in the primary care outpatient clinic such as uncontrolled diabetes and diabetic neuropathy, or alcohol use disorder and liver failure, may stem from trauma that they experienced as a child or are experiencing now. Trauma has widespread effects on health and should be something you consider addressing throughout each patient encounter you have. Let's move on and discuss how we can incorporate these important communication and care techniques in our practice. So how do we support and empower our patients? even in the time constraints of today's quick outpatient appointments. First, we should integrate regular and routine behavioral health screenings that may give us insight to the places we should dive a little deeper. This includes asking about their mood at each visit, asking what or any substances they use, like cigarettes, including e-cigs and vapes in our modern day, alcohol, and illicit substances. Even with marijuana being legalized in many states, be sure to ask about its use too. An important point is to ask about their support and who helps them. Oftentimes, your patients are the only ones responsible for the care of their family and the bills. So offering support services and assistance finding ways to offload stress is huge. It truly takes a village, so be sure to ask about where they're getting their support while they support others. And last but not least, be sure to screen for suicide risk and thoughts of ending their own life. Like we mentioned before, 
Patients who have experienced trauma likely have emotional disorders and poor coping strategies, which lead to a slippery slope of thoughts that might lead them to consider suicide. It's important to inquire about this, not only to protect them, but also get them plugged into support services that can get them the help that they need. As a part of our clinical toolbox, we should also ask about any physical or emotional symptoms that affect their life. Often, patients can experience anxiety or depression so debilitating that they can't get out of bed or visit a certain place because it may be a trigger. It's imperative that we identify those symptoms so we can give the patient the care they need to address and overcome these issues. And when addressing patients regarding their trauma or resulting symptoms of trauma, avoid invasive questioning about the events or circumstances. If a patient needs to unload or describe them, they will freely volunteer the information. However, we should never subject our patients to questioning that may lead to re-traumatization and re-experiencing the initial trauma. Moving on, something that we should do from the very beginning of each encounter is to reassure patients that they are in control of their visit and have a significant voice in their care. This is something that we should do not only in our trauma-informed communications, but also in all patient-centered interview techniques, something that we discuss in another of our Public Health Express videos. Patients should know that they are empowered to deny any part of their visit, whether it's in the physical exam, interviews, or questioning, and especially when it comes to reporting to officials. So often in patients who experience trauma, feelings of powerlessness are experienced. However, it's important as their healthcare provider that you empower them and let them know that they are in control. And last but not least, patients should know that during any portion of their visit or for its entirety, they are entitled to have support people, whether it's personal or staff, in the room with them. Having a shoulder to lean on and for support is imperative to help the patient know that the hospital or office is a safe space where they are heard and considered important. That's all we have to cover for today. Let's check in with a quick flash quiz before recapping the important points from our discussion. Imagine yourself in clinic and in the middle of a physical exam. If the patient grows increasingly uncomfortable during the physical exam, should you proceed or pause and check in with them? If you chose the latter, you're right. Always check in with the patient. A large part of trauma-informed communication and patient-centered interviewing is to empower the patient and let them know that they are in control of the encounter. That includes the questions asked or parts or the entirety of the physical exam. Even if the exam has started, they are well within their rights to stop at any point. Before you go, let's cover a few quick takeaways from today's video. Like we discussed on our first slide, recognized trauma encompasses many different experiences at any time in a patient's life. This includes emotional, physical, and sexual violence, neglect, poverty, and discrimination. And while everyone can experience trauma, know that certain populations like children, women, individuals with low socioeconomic status, and minority populations experience more trauma. And why is this important? Trauma at any point has significant short-term and long-term effects, which are many of the serious chronic conditions that we already are fighting. Heart and lung disease, diabetes and obesity, and mental health disorders like depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicide. And lastly, Trauma-informed communication considers the scope of trauma and its long-term effects and works to consider the impact to care we give patients, including routine and regular screenings and constant empowerment and support through clinical practices like we discussed in this video. Thank you for tuning in today and learning about this very important topic. The way we provide care to our patients, whether they have experienced trauma or not, can open doors and truly make a difference in the lives of our patients. Small details and learning these techniques early can make a world of difference in the long run. Not only for our clinical skills, but most importantly for our patients. Thank you again for dedicating the time to yourself and to your patients. Again, my name is Lindsay, and it's been a joy walking you through First Aid's public health chapter. If you thought this video was helpful, throw a thumbs up down below. I'll see you back here for more First Aid Express videos. Good luck and happy studying!